I am Jose Antonio Sabalgoitia, and I want to give you a very warm welcome to all of you to the Embassy of Mexico to the Kingdom of the Netherlands for the panel discussion Transnational Civil Litigation and Corporate Liability, Mexico versus Smith & Wesson. This is a very important panel discussion for the government of Mexico and is uh, also a, a breakthrough uh, discussion on a very significant uh, exercise of international law uh, litigation by the government of Mexico. It is no accident that we have this panel discussion here in the Netherlands and here specifically in The Hague because this is also the headquarters of many international organizations which uh, contribute on a daily basis to enriching international law. So I want to first of all thank the Asser Institute and in particular Professor and Dr. Tilo Maraun and Dr. Leon Castellanos for hosting this event along with our ASER Institute Center for International and European Law. And I want to give a very special thanks on behalf of the Embassy to the Royal Netherlands Society of International Law and to the Netherlands Network for Human Rights Research. It is also an honor for the Embassy that Mexico's legal advisor, Alejandro Celorio, is participating in, in this panel. So with this, I would now again uh, give you a very warm welcome and uh, let's hear from uh, Dr. Tilo Maraun. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Savaloitia, for this very, very warm welcome. Tilo is joining us online in a second. My name is Leon Castellanos Jankiewicz and I'm a researcher in international law at the Asser Institute. And together with Professor Tilo Maraun from the University of Amsterdam, and with the Embassy of Mexico to the Kingdom of the Netherlands, I am one of the conveners of this very interesting and important event. And so on behalf of the Asser Institute, I would also like to welcome you all here today, whether you are joining in person in this room or online at home, wherever you are. I would also like to join the ambassador in thanking the Royal Netherlands Society of International Law for their generous support and specifically to its president, Professor Willem van Genoten from Tilburg University and also to Professor Yvonne Donders from the Netherlands Network for Human Rights Research. I also uh, thank my colleague and now friend Patricia Perez Galeana, first secretary of the Embassy of Mexico in the Netherlands, and Kaya van der Horst, the current human rights intern at the Asser Institute. I also uh, thank Alejandro Celorio Alcantara, the legal advisor who is joining us fresh off the plane, I'm told, from Mexico today here in The Hague. Welcome, Alejandro. Gracias. Before I hand over to Tilo, uh, Professor Tilo Maraun, for a few words of welcome, I will introduce us all to the reason why we're sitting here today. And that is because last August, Mexico filed a complaint against Smith & Wesson and other gun manufacturers and wholesalers to pressure the US gun industry into exercising due diligence over the production and distribution of their products. Mexico claims damages in the form of healthcare expenses, security expenses, and other costs, in addition to economic loss arising from the company's negligent failure, and I quote, to exercise reasonable care from the complaint in manufacturing, marketing, and selling their guns in ways that reduce the likeliness of being trafficked into and causing harm in Mexico. According to Mexico, these negligent practices are the proximate cause of the gun violence that resulted in the loss of 68,000 lives in the Mexican territory since 2019 alone. And so here we have a very special case because it seeks to protect the public interest, the safety and security of citizens and inhabitants of Mexico through civil law. Uh, which usually is an instrument to protect private interests, civil law is. And so that's why this case is very interesting and emblematic, I would say. At the foreign policy level, Mexico has also raised the issue with the U.S. government bilaterally, 
And Foreign Minister Marcelo Ebrard delivered a statement on November 22nd in the UN Security Council framing arms trafficking, trafficking as, and I quote, a threat to international peace and security. End quote. Language, of course, lifted from Chapter 7 of the UN Charter. We thought it was important to discuss this case here today because strategic civil litigation, such as this one, is being increasingly employed to protect public interests. Judicial developments in climate change are among the most recent and prominent examples of this, and Tilo will highlight some other examples from the field of arms control. We can cite the recent decision of the Administrative Tribunal of Paris of October 2021, which applied a civil liability provision for ecological damages to the problem of climate change and found the French government responsible for not having put in place measures that were concrete enough to meet commitments under domestic EU and international climate change law. Another interesting climate change case was decided in this very city of The Hague in 2015. The now famous Urgenda versus the Netherlands, decided by the Hague District Court, which found that the Dutch state had the obligation to reduce its greenhouse gas emissions by 25% by 2020 compared to 1990 uh, levels. And in Urgenda, the District Court also based its decision on tort law civil law. But while it is relatively easy to argue that states such as the Netherlands or France have mitigation and other obligations towards their population under tort law, climate treaties, human rights treaties, and customary international law, it is not altogether obvious that these obligations can be transposed to corporations, such as in this case. We do see some progress, however. For example, on 26th of May, 2021, the District Court, again, of The Hague, issued a judgment finding that Royal Dutch Shell had an obligation to mitigate climate change. Shell, of course, a multinational, all-powerful company. Shell was ordered to reduce all CO2 resulting from its global operations by 45%, by 2030 compared to 2019, and it's the first time a court has imposed on a corporation such a broad mitigation obligation. That judgment is also based on tort law and includes references to human rights and climate treaties, of course. Further, UK case law on jurisdiction also points to a wider interpretation of the admissibility for civil liability claims against mother corporations. And so for all these reasons, we thought that Mexico's civil complaint against Smith & Wesson and other gun manufacturers in the U.S. District Court of Massachusetts falls squarely within this broader trend of protecting public interests through civil litigation and also presents a distinct model, a way forward within that trend for two big reasons that we will continue discussing with Alejandro today, but also with the distinguished panel that will follow us. These reasons are that Mexico has sued a corporation, but also that it, is, that it is appearing in the court in its sovereign capacity as a state. And so this is why we believe this case offers an interesting template to continue discussing the prospects of similar cases that can hopefully improve the day-to-day -day lives of everyone. With this, I would like to hand over to my colleague Tilo Maraun, who is joining us from Germany. Tilo, please, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Leon. Um, Ambassador, your excellencies, colleagues and friends. I'm very happy to welcome you together with my colleague, Leon, and uh, to actually introduce you briefly to the subject under consideration on our panel. As Leon has already highlighted, this is a very important issue. And I would like to follow up upon his comments with a view to arms control law. 
As you may know, I'm uh, the new chair of uh, arms control law at the University of Amsterdam, seconded to the Asser Institute. What we see indeed in these numerous cases that uh, Leon has already started uh, to highlight is something that is of major relevance for the development of international law in general, and that is the decentralized enforcement of international law through national courts. Whereas we have seen this in the past, primarily through the avenue of national implementation of international law, today we see an expanded version thereof. And there are numerous examples um, uh, Leon has already pinpointed the climate change cases. There are other cases, many of them in the field of human rights. There are cases that concern migration law, and uh, we will have on the panel with us a representative of the European Centre of uh, uh, Constitutional and Human Rights, and they are pursuing some of these cases which are often labeled strategic litigation cases. Now, in order to better assess the value of these cases for the development of international law, I believe it is important to first point out that there are deficiencies in the implementation of international law at the international level. Access to courts is limited. If we think about the International Court of Justice or the International Criminal Court or regional courts, they are all developing, but often procedures are indeed difficult and the access route through national law, through national courts is much easier. Indeed, more recently, um, the cases have been brought that also concern the implementation of international humanitarian law. And currently there is a case pending before the Federal Constitutional Court in Germany, which actually addresses the issue of um, drone-based attacks in the Yemen civil war. So we see, generally speaking, that international law actually benefits from decentralized enforcement through national courts. And we see the same, by the way, with numerous cases currently going on, among others in Germany, concerning violations of the laws of war in Syria and elsewhere. Let us now briefly turn to the arms control side of the case and the consideration, because this is something that we should not lose sight of. If we look at um, uh, the context at the international level, indeed the arms trade treaty comes to mind. The arms trade treaty has not only ratif been ratified, by many states, but it has also been signed. Who are very familiar with some of the treaty issues that arise in the context of uh, signing a treaty are fully aware of Article 18 of the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties, which attaches to the signature of a state below a treaty actually a certain value and this value entails that the state and the consideration is barred from actually harming achieving the object and purpose of that treaty. While this has not been on the table in the case and the consideration during our panel, I believe that this is an important add-on. And let me add a third add-on which actually opens up um, the field of human rights law. The field of human rights law is increasingly important when it comes to positive obligations of states. States are not only subject to the obligation not to interfere with the right to life, for example, or to bodily integrity of individuals, but if you look at um, treaties in 
particular human rights treaties, and we may mention the two UN covenants, it comes to mind that states are indeed under a positive obligation uh, that goes beyond uh, the obligation not to interfere with the right to life. They have to positively protect the life of their citizens and of those individuals subject to their control. In this context, indeed, not only strategic litigation comes to mind, but there are cross-cutting avenues between arms control law, international humanitarian law, and human rights law. And in order to explore these avenues, I think it is worthwhile, even beyond today's panel, to actually further look into the way civil society can actually operationalize international law in the field of peace and security. Given today's circumstances, I believe that this is ever more important. I want to thank expressly all the participants on the panel, and I will be happy to follow your discussions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Thilo, for, for this a very interesting introduction from the standpoint of arms control law. And this really um, brings us, opens up the, um, the field uh, considerably and shows us that there's extremely uh, a lot of potential for this case uh, in other areas. So why don't we start the discussion with Alejandro? Uh, that's a very nice bridge towards our interactive dialogue here with you. Uh, I will be, we will be interacting for about 20 minutes. We will save five minutes towards the end for questions and comments from the audience. And also, if you are following us online, please use the Q&A question and answer function to post your questions. I have a laptop here in front of me. I will open it in about 20 minutes to look at your questions for Alejandro. So Alejandro, welcome once again to the Netherlands. It's great to see you. Thank you very much, Leon. Let me start by saying thank you to Ambassador Sabalgoitia, thank you to the Embassy of Mexico in the Netherlands, the Yasser Institute, and other conveners. Thank you for this opportunity to share uh, details on what we're doing. It's a pleasure. Can you tell us a bit about the background of the case? Before we you know, dive into the details, in particular, how did the Mexican government identify gun trafficking as a critical case at the U.S. border? Well, sadly, we live in an environment of armed violence for the last three decades. We've been seeing a rise in the number of fatalities by um, gunfire and people hurt and the constant feeling of insecurity. Um, and it's important to highlight in this opportunity that, that in Mexico, we only have one gun dealer, one office managed by the Department of uh, Defense, the Ministry of Defense, where um, private citizens can acquire a permit and then buy for their use um, weapons with a very small caliber. These are not the military style weapons that we see in the hands of criminals. These are weapons for self-defense. So what is the issue? That whereas in Mexico we only have one place where private citizens can acquire these kind of weapons, in our neighbor, neighboring country to the north there's thousands of point of sale where people, private citizens, can acquire high firepower, either handguns or military style rifles. So the issue is that from a legal market, through the facilitation of illicit trafficking, we see um, a constant flow of weapons in the order of half a million weapons a year, the majority military style rifles in the order of 70 to 90 percent coming from the United States. So the issue is the quantity and the level, the, the, the firepower of these weapons that shouldn't exist in Mexico if it wasn't for the illicit trafficking coming from the United States. Right. And the weapons that you identify in Mexico as causing all this violence are coming from, are made by these companies that that Mexico is complaining against in the United States. So in, in this first stage, and let me just share a bit more of how we got in, into this. Um, for the longest time, governments have been working to stop the illicit traffic on weapons. 
we work with the United States, we do our own share as the Mexican government to protect our borders, we deploy security forces at the border, um, the U.S. do it as well under their own legal system. We do have a, a, a crime that is the illicit trafficking of weapons. In the United States, they resort on other crimes. They do not have a crime of illicit trafficking per se. Um, we work together, we share information, we have mirroring patrol, we go together to multilateral fora. A lot we do as governments, together and unilaterally. We prosecute the consumers, we pro uh, prosecute um, the criminals that use these weapons. But there was a missing link. And these are the corporations that feed these consumers. Let's keep in mind that these consumers in Mexico shouldn't exist. There's only, as I mentioned, one store. And these consumers are fed not only of these weapons, but also through advertisement, enticing them to buy these weapons and try to acquire them in the US market. So by looking into this missing link, we are complementing the governmental efforts that we do through diplomatic channels and political engagement. There was a need to do something to the source, not only at the flow of the river, if you think of this iron river that has been used to describe the illicit trafficking of weapons from the United States into Mexico, not only at the flow or at the end that would be in the Mexican territory, but at the origin, which is in the United States. In this litigation, um, there's a lot more companies that we could sue, but we're suing the eight companies that represent around 62% of the totality of weapons coming from the United States that are traced through a program managed by ATF and uh, the Attorney General's office in Mexico, that the serial numbers are run, and we can know from the weapons found in the crime scene to the point of sale, purchaser, time of manufacture, and place of manufacturing. This is very interesting. Now, I see that you describe the companies as a missing link. Um, I would like to ask you whether Mexico has approached either the companies before going to court or the United States government in terms of strengthening its regulatory regime in order to ensure that these weapons don't end up at the border and then trafficked into Mexico in the first place. So isn't there um, a way a pathway uh, in that regard as well. Has Mexico tried these, these, um, these means? One of the complexities of this lawsuit, we're suing companies that enjoy um, a legal framework that is extremely beneficial to their trade and their practice. So we wouldn't, as we don't like other governments to question our domestic laws, we wouldn't ask the United States to change their laws. We do say that the illicit traffic facilitated by the negligence of these companies is hurting us, but we don't say change your law. We do say you should put, deploy more forces at the border. Your checkpoints at the border should look for migrants and illicit substances, but also weapons going south. But what we're doing with the companies is saying, Companies, you are, what you're doing, your negligent or your illicit activities are hurting us, government of Mexico. And regardless of what we do in the political arena with the United States, we need to solve this, this harm that you're producing to us. Now, did we approach the companies? No. Why? And I have to commend our attorneys, um, Jonathan um, Lowy from Brady Gun Prevention Center and Steve Shadowin, this is the, the masterminds of this litigation, this formula of transboundary tort. In our strategy as a team, we decided not to approach the companies for one main reason. We believe that until there is a judicial sentence and opinion, by the court that can be enforced by an American court, there's gonna be changes in the way these companies uh, trade their weapons. Why? Because for decades they have faced litigation. Some have been successful, the majority haven't been successful. 
in the beginning of the 2000s, Smith and Wesson agreed to the Clinton administration to make changes to self-regulate the, their trade and the way they, they sell firearms, to monitor and sanction their distribution chain to prevent that their weapons cause harm. It was 2001. Nothing has changed. Now, was there any appeal to approach the companies where we're going to make any change? No. And at the end, we're the government of Mexico. We have no power over these corporations in the United States. We're suing because a US federal judge will have power to enforce any decision that he might take on this case. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, could you explain, you mentioned in, in, in your presentation just now the concept of transboundary tort. And I think this uh, encapsulates the way in which the lawsuit has been conceptualized by the team, uh, both in the Mexican ministry and, and with the attorneys that are representing Mexico in Boston. So how is the, the suit designed? Under what headings, what kinds of um, pleadings is Mexico asking the court uh, to decide on? And what, is, what are Mexico's claims? Could you briefly just outline them uh, for us? Certainly. The main argument is that Mexico is now in an uh, environment of armed violence. The government of Mexico has suffered harm because in this condition or situation of armed violence, not only direct harm, um, members of our armed forces and law enforcement agencies have died or have been um, hurt. We have paid uh, funeral services, medical services, insurances. We need to buy more firepower, more guns. We need to deploy more forces. We need to um, use more of taxpayers' money to face this armed violence that is generated or produced by the illicit trafficking of guns from the United States. And this illicit trafficking of guns from the United States is actively facilitated, and that is the key, by the negligent and illicit conducts of the companies we're suing. In one sentence, what is the negligence? The companies fail to foresee that their product is causing harm in Mexico and is used by criminals to commit crimes. Now, I'll develop a bit more in this sense. The companies are on notice. This is not something the armed violence in Mexico didn't start yesterday, a week ago. It's been increasing since 2004 when the uh, assault weapons ban expired in the United States. More weapons, more military-styled uh, rifles, more homicides in Mexico. There's a correlation there. These companies know, and not only because of the traceability of the, the serial number of the weapons that is available to them, the a corresponding agency in the United States, the ATF, the alcohol, alcohol, tobacco, firearms, and munitions, and explosives. In, in the US will present or allow these companies to see the traceability information of, um, to know that their guns were used in crimes in Mexico. But through social media, organized crimes show their firepower, government um, briefs, reports by the UN, even the narco series in the platforms. The companies know that their product is being used to commit crimes in Mexico, and they do nothing, even though they should have a higher care, a higher diligence, because they're selling an instrument that by its nature will cause, is, is designed to harm, to kill, to destroy. They don't take the care that they should, that other industries, like the automobile industry, if they believe that their product will cause harm, they immediately recall. Well, differently, these companies, the companies we're suing, they do nothing to make changes, to monitor the distribution chain, and to sanction those um, parts in their distribution chain that are actively facilitating, aiding and abating, in a way being accomplice of criminal organizations that buy these weapons in the United States and then use them in Mexico. One of the... Uh the things that you have highlighted here is the aspect of foreseeability. So it seems, according to Mexico's uh, theory and its claims, that because there is such a systematic uh, 
traceability and incidence of violence caused by the weapons, um, that that is why uh, Mexico has a claim before the court based on civil law. Um, but as you know, what makes this case so unique, and you know what I'm going to talk about now, Alejandro, uh, is the infamous PLCAA, known as PLACA. As you know, PLACA is a statute, a U.S. statute, that gives immunity to the gun industry for legal claims based on damages caused by third parties. So if a criminal buys a gun, uses the gun to commit a crime, according to the PLCAA, there is no claim that the victims or their families can make to uh, go against the companies. And the companies have raised this as a very, very fundamental objection uh, to Mexico's claims to the extent that they have filed a motion to dismiss the case, which was heard three weeks ago in Boston. You were there. And, and now this is a, a very important decision that the judge is going to have to make. And this statute stands at the center of uh, this, this decision. Could you tell us a little bit more about the statute and how it plays into Mexico's strategy? I mean, if we're talking about that big hurdle, I'll mention the first hurdle that we need to overcome, that is a standing. Um, we do believe that we have a standing. We, the government of Mexico is suing as the victim. There's uh, very superficially the requirements to prove a standing is that um, you can show harm and there's a connection, a causality between the actions of the person that is being sued and the harm that is claimed by the person that is suing. Um, there's a um, legal precedent in the United States that um, allows a foreign government to sue, uh, to um, file a, a civil lawsuit against an individual or a company in the United States if they feel they have suffered harm. Um, we believe and we stated that way in the oral arguments that we, are, we have suffered harm as the government of Mexico and we will be able to prove it. Um, there's actually one part of the hearing when one of the attorneys said, if needed, we'll make the right questions to the defendants. And she was referring to the traceability information. We're suing in Massachusetts but because there's a connection of the companies with Massachusetts and Massachusetts with the weapons found in crime scenes in Mexico. And that is known through the traceability information that, by the way, is not public. There's something called the Tier Amendment that the gun lobby or the gun industry has pushed to um, prohibit the ATF from making this information public. If the information of traceability was public and we display it here in the, in the screen, we would be surprised at the connections of the manufacturing manufacturer, the point of sale, the distribution, and their consumers in Mexico. That's going to be seen in discovery when we get there. Now, um, the second hurdle, the PLCAA. Sadly, the, on average, there's two um, mass shootings in the United States per day. And these mass shootings, the majority will file, the survivors or the relatives of the victims will file a civil lawsuit against uh, the manufacturers or the sellers or the distributors and they always face this PLCAA immunity statute. Well, what are we claiming as government of Mexico in, in, in brief? We say, under the theory of conflict of law, the law that the judge, the substantive law that the judge should apply is Mexican law, because the law that applies is the law where the harm is suffered. Mexico, we don't have a PLCAA, under Mexican tort law, there's not, we are able to sue um, these companies. That's one argument. The second argument is PLCAA, in its terms, has no mention of extraterritorial effects, meaning that it all only covers and protects the, these companies from civil liability, from harm, um, occur in the United States, not from harm that happens in Mexico. Therefore, our litigation should proceed. And there's a third element. If P 
PLCAA was to apply, there are certain exceptions that we're resorting on. Um, one of them is that these companies are violating federal and state statutes. Uh, a federal law that they're violating is that they are facilitating and they're selling machine guns. Because under the definition of the, uh, the Department of Justice, a machine gun is not only uh, uh, a rifle that is a, of automatic, but also one that by its design can be easily manipulated. And nowadays, these semi-automatic rifles, military-style rifles, with a little tweak, can become of... Um, like fast shooting, like a, like a machine gun. That's one example. There's other example that is um, uh, useful to mention. The companies are violating through, the, because of their advertising uh, policies, they're violating consumer uh, protection um, statutes. Why? Because they are false, false advertising products that under US law are sold for recreational activities or collection, but they're selling them as military products aimed or advertised to people that want to be in a war, enticing them to use them as means of destruction. Whereas under US law, as we understand it, they are used for recreational or collection, not to make war. That's something reserved to the states. So that's the second hurdle of, that we believe will overcome easily. So I, I want to um, ask a follow-up question about the PLACA statute, uh, because I can see how Mexico argues Mexican law applies because the damage occurs in Mexico, the victims are in Mexico, the tort occurs in Mexico, and Mexico has standing in the United States court to bring these claims in its own name. I can see that very, very clearly. Um, but what if the judge, uh, and, and therefore PLC would not apply because PLCAA only applies to claims based on US law, right? That's what Mexico is saying. But you say it's Mexican law which applies, so PLCAA should be set aside. Of course, the companies have another theory. Um, so if that theory would prevail, and if, they, uh, if the judge agreed with the companies that Mexico's law does not apply to the case, does Mexico still have a case on the basis of these consumer protection laws that you have cited? Uh, yes, yes, we do. We do. There's three arguments that we present around PLCAA for the judge to choose. Right. Then another thing I wanted to cover was the issue of foreseeability that you also have already mentioned. And that, and that goes straight to um, also to another objection that the companies made. Uh, and it also has to do with causation. They say that the damage complained of is too remote uh, a relationship with the actions al uh, alleged by Mexico, that their conduct uh, is too far down the causal chain to, for them to be responsible for what is happening in Mexico and that it is not reasonable for them to be held accountable for those acts that are happening so far down the chain. And so this very point, and I'm asking you this because this very point came up during the hearing with Judge Saylor on 12 April, and he was asking Mexican counsel about the, and I quote, the logical stopping point of the causal chain. So what is uh, the position of Mexico here? What can you tell us about distinguishing well, first of all, talking about the logical stopping point, but then distinguishing some of the cases that Judge Saylor mentioned. So he talked about um, what if a U.S. court is seized for the commission of crimes of, of products uh, with products in other countries. So a single shooter, for example, using a gun uh, that is purchased uh, by, from one of the, from one of the uh, defendants and the shooter kills someone in Tel Aviv. Does, does the state of Israel now also have a claim or does Italy have a claim because the Italian mafia is using their products or even he also talked about the war in Ukraine right can Russia go to a US court and sue uh, these manufacturers so talk let's talk a little bit yeah. more about causation and foreseeability um, we claim in our um, complaint that the illicit 
traffic of weapons renders around 250 million in profit to these companies. So as the harm is foreseeable, the profit is foreseeable as well. So our understanding and our argument is that the companies know that there's a consumer's market in Mexico is not a single shooter. It's sadly tens, if not more, of individuals acting alone or acting in, in, in an organized gang or group that need that firepower. And sometimes that group is facing another group that needs higher firepower. So we get this spiral of armed violence where the ones that profit are the companies. So to the point of the judge of what is the difference between what happens in Palestine or the judge even mentioned uh, the situation in, in if Russia could sue the US for the guns, for the harm caused by the guns used by Ukrainians. The set of elements is completely different from any other situation in the world to what happens in Mexico because we're seeing here decades of profiting, of profits from this illicit trafficking. These companies have their regular market, consumers market in the United States, and then they have the Mexican consumers market. How is it that we're gonna prove? By connecting the dots of traceability. Let's see if you have uh, favorite sellers and favorite buyers, your straw purchasers, repeat sellers. Let's see if Barrett is one of the, the companies we're showing. Is the, the sniper rifle, 50 caliber, the, the bullet is the size of a crayon. If that rifle is sold in particular points and bought by particular groups, that will be seen in discovery through the traceability. But not only that, we have the marketing, the way these companies are advertising their products. When you have a Colt Super 38 that is not sold in Mexico to, to civilians and is named Jefe de Jefes or has Aztec designs or um, pictures or, um, of um, our Mexican history heroes, that is clearly um, advertisement for Mexicans and most likely to criminals. When you have a weapon that is made with gold and incrustations of these details. So that's the connection. It's foreseeability that your product could cause harm, but also foreseeability that your product will be bought by these um, consumers that have to resort in the illicit trafficking. Otherwise, they cannot get it in Mexico. Right. No, it would seem then that the weapons are being commercialized from Mexico in every sense, but the formal one. Exactly. I would like to now open the um, discussion now for questions. Thank you, Alejandro. We're almost reaching the, the end of our time here in this really interesting discussion. We could go on and on, uh, but I would like to ask uh, our attendees here in the room whether there are any questions. Uh, please raise your hand and the mic will come up to you. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. So happy to see you, Alejandro and Leon also here. Just one, one very quick question. It's very clear from your presentation that the defendant is a, a group of private companies. But my question is how treaty law obligations have come into place, particularly uh, treaty uh, law obligations uh, acquired by Mexico as an importer of uh, firearms. Um, there are several, the Inter-American Convention, the Palermo Convention, they establish obligations for importers, not only in establishing a licensing system, but also in taking measures at the border. I wonder if, if this has been an argument from the defendant against Mexico. Let's take both questions together, uh, since we're a little bit tight for time, and please. Thank you. Uh, my name is Jose Miguel. I'm from the Ministry of Justice. A very small 
practical questions. Question: Have you seen uh, guns that can be traced to European uh, gun manufacturers? Maybe one more question here. Hi, my name is Deborah Ruiz Verduzco. I'm with the International Commission on Missing Persons. And um, I, I wonder, with respect to the challenge on standing of the Mexican government in the claim, um, has the law firm, has, has, has it been assessed if there are more prospects, if, uh, if the case can be strengthened or maybe reinforced by a separate claim or by a joint claim um, by those victims of the crimes directly? You know, the, the victims are very well organized in Mexico, families of the missing are, and other victims of violence. So has this factor been assessed to strengthen the, the legal opportunity? Thank you. Alejandro, you can take these three questions and maybe I'll ask one follow-up from uh, our attendees online, but please go ahead. On, on treaty obligations, um, it hasn't come around the litigation per se, but in the conversation with the stakeholders and other interested in this, um, Mexico is doing its share and we definitely need to do more. We have a 3,000 kilometer border with the United States. Um, we ask our American colleagues to do more. We need to work to stop the flow of weapons. But what is interesting, Ambassador, on, on treaty obligations is that there's a lot of language out there in terms of risk assessment before um, allowing or permitting um, a, an export. Um, notions of final user and final use. And actually, the United States are very um, particular in um, demanding and asking that Mexico, we buy a lot from these same companies we're suing, but through the legal channels. And we have to verify, and uh, the United States Senate is very um, strict in demanding that the weapons are used solely for the purpose they were sold, that is, they're used by the state and law enforcement agencies. This is just a, a brief comment. These same ideas of final user, final use, risk assessment that are already known by these companies that legally sell or export should be used in the way they sell domestically. They have room of opportunity there. In terms of um, European guns found in Mexico, um, the majority of the guns of um, European manufacturing or European design are found in Mexico after they're sold in the United States. So the United States will import them, actually, um, an El Paso shooting, August the 3rd, 2019, uh, an individual bought a Vassar 10, it's a Romanian design, um, and killed 22 people in that event. That event actually triggered all this litigation, but the majority are designed or imported into, into the United States and then trafficked it into Mexico. Now, in victims, this lawsuit is in, inspired in all the victims of armed violence in Mexico. As a strategy, and because we're resorting in this argument of public nuance, it was less complex for us, and because this was urgent, to sue as the government of Mexico as a single entity because we're facing two big hurdles. And standing, I wouldn't be that much concerned, but PLCAA. So our argument of public nuance and other elements that I describe and I can um, explain further later on, um, we have more opportunity as the government of Mexico. Now the victims, they have their claims and they can do it. Now one challenge that it is important to highlight, if we have too many lawsuits, there can be um, under the, the multiple district litigation, a, a judge and perhaps a forum that is not that appealing could attract all the, all the litigations. And we could be um, litigating in Texas or in Louisiana or in Arkansas. So this is, there's a strategy behind the forum, the defendants, the time and the arguments we're making. Great. Thank you, Alejandro. Before I hand over to the panel, um, I think it would be a nice transition to ask you the questions that we have here in the chat. A lot of them have to do with the hearing that took place in Boston uh, a few weeks ago. And so could you share with us a few scenarios that you see um, 
in the, in the foreseeable future regarding this litigation? What would happen if the judge uh, decides to move forward with the case? What would happen if the judge decides to set the case aside and say no jurisdiction for Mexico in this court? Well, what, what we're prepared for is the judge could give the reason and dismiss the case on personal jurisdiction to, um, uh, against the government of Mexico. We would appeal. Um, the argument is that we will request a judge that ma before making a determination on personal jurisdiction, there's an opportunity to have some discovery for the, to, to prove that there actually is. Um, so we would appeal if the, uh, the opinion is uh, unfavorable to the government of Mexico. And I believe the same sense, the companies, if the, the decision is favorable to the government of Mexico, would appeal. Now, there's a, 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 a mixed scenario, a middle scenario. Um, there's eight defendants. So some of their motions could proceed and some others couldn't. So we might have eight different scenarios, but uh, it's part of the strategy. Um, we, we thought it like that. So uh, we're waiting for their solution. But the, the, the answer, um, both parties have the ability to appeal um, the decision of the judge. Excellent. Thank you very, very much, Alejandro, for, for this very insightful discussion. Thank you. I'm now going to uh, give the floor to my colleague Marina Aksenova, who is Assistant Professor of Comparative and International Criminal Law, and uh, the fantastic panel that she's going, in, going to introduce. Alejandro is staying here with the panel uh, to further engage with you and also online. So thank you very much for your attention up to now. And Marina, please join us. Welcome everyone. It is my great pleasure and honor to continue this event with moderating an excellent panel of experts. And we have approximately one hour for the whole discussion. Our panel members will start with a five minute introduction each into their topic, into their respective field of expertise and how it relates to our today's discussion and then we will open a floor for a uh, discussion where I will be taking questions both from audience here in person and also from uh, people online. So we will try to have at least two rounds of questions. And I will briefly introduce all of the panel members now. And of course, I will not do justice to their expertise and their CVs. So if you're interested, please have a look at the program. And obviously, online, there is a lot of information. So the first person who will be speaking is Professor Carlos Vasquez. He's professor of law at Georgetown University Law Center. He was a member of the Inter-American Juridical Committee and the UN Committee for the Elimination of Racial Discrimination. Importantly for this case, he is a member of the American Law Institute, where he advises on foreign relations law and conflict of laws. The second speaker today is Professor Leila Nadia Sadat, who is James Carr Professor of International Criminal Law at Washington University in St. Louis. She is also a special advisor on crimes against humanity to the ICC prosecutor, and she held this role since 2012. She is also director of Crimes Against Humanity Initiative, uh, which resulted in uh, draft articles for the new Convention on Crimes uh, Against Humanity. And of course, she is renowned internationally as an expert in international criminal law, international law, and international human rights law. Then we will have a pleasure of hearing from Christian uh, Schliemann, who is a senior legal advisor at the European Center for Constitutional and Human Rights uh, in Berlin, which is a, an NGO and a powerhouse. Um, there, uh, Dr. Schliemann co-directs the Business and Human Rights Program. Uh, Christian has a PhD from Freie Universität Berlin. And then finally, we are going to hear from 
Dalia Palombo, who is with us in person. She is Assistant Professor of Human Rights Law at Tilburg University. She previously held positions at London School of Economics and at the University of St. Gallen. And importantly for this uh, case, Dalia's research focuses on business and human rights, extraterritoriality, uh, transnationality, and the impact of human rights on private law litigation. So it is my great honor to welcome all of you, and I first give floor to Carlos. Thank you. Um, first, uh, let me thank the conveners for putting on this very important event uh, and for inviting me to speak today. Um, I should say, begin by saying that I, uh, I followed this case closely, but from the perspective of private international law and conflict of laws, which is my uh, specialty. And, and uh, so I, I say that uh, to say that I, I defer to my co-panelists and, and other speakers on the facts of this uh, underlying the, the claim, as well as the substantive gun control laws that are implicated in the claim. Uh, we've already heard uh, about those from uh, Alejandro, uh, but I'll be focusing on, on the issues of conflict of laws, private international law, which, we, which Alejandro also spoke about. Um, so what are the main uh, issues with respect to conflict of laws? Well, as we've already heard, um, choice of law is, is a very important threshold question. Uh, Mexico argues that this cl these claims are based on Mexican law. And uh, so the, the court will have to decide as a threshold matter whether the claims are based on Mexican law or US law or Massachusetts law. Um, and for, for this purpose, the court will apply Massachusetts choice of law rules. Uh, that might be surprising to, to those of you not from the United States, but in the United States, choice of law, even international choice of law, is a matter of state law. And uh, under Massachusetts choice of law rules, uh, Mexico argues that the, uh, the law that applies is the law of the place of injury. And as we've heard, uh, very uh, substantial, devastating injuries occurred in Mexican territory. So that's the basis of the choice of law claim. Um, one thing that's interesting to note, and it relates to some of the introductory remarks, is that the, the in, in, this, in this scenario, or on this issue, the, the parties are arguing about whether to apply Mexican tort law or U.S. tort law. And so the, the, the focus is not on applying international human rights law or international law more generally. Um, so it's, uh, it's, uh, that's an interesting feature of this litigation. It's based on a, a tort model. And in the United States, uh, it's perhaps not, so, not surprising because there has been a line of cases in the United States where uh, human, international human rights law was the basis of suit, uh, but the US Supreme Court has cut back on that line of cases significantly in the Kiobel case and subsequent cases. So um, it's, it's much more difficult to bring suits in the United States based directly on international human rights law for injuries that occurred outside the United States. And that's because of the presumption against extraterritorial which the court has applied and, and invigorated in recent cases. That leads me to actually the second major uh, uh, choice of law question or conflict of laws question, which Alejandra also referenced, which is also the, the whether the PLICA statute, the um, a protection uh, um, of lawful commerce uh, in the Arms Act, uh, uh, applies to this case. Uh, this, this law confers a protection from liability for gun manufacturers. Uh, but the question is, does, it, does the protection that it affords apply to this case? And here the, the uh, position of the Mexican government is that it does not because it does not apply extraterritorially. So the, the presumption against extraterritorial, uh, extraterritoriality, which um, makes it difficult to maintain the claim based on international human rights law, also um, favors the Mexican government's position in this case because of the argument that the, the, the statute conferring an immunity on gun manufacturers also does not apply extraterritorially. Um, I uh, am a signatory to an amicus brief in the case, and, and uh, the brief was submitted on behalf of uh, professors, U.S. professors of transnational litigation, and the, the brief uh, argues that the PLCA does not apply to this case because of the, pres uh, the law that relates to extraterritorial application of, of federal statutes. Uh, in particular, uh, we argue that it does not apply to claims based on foreign law. So um, I think my, my five minutes are, are more than up, so I'll, I'll leave it there, but I'll be happy to elaborate on any of those points um, uh, during the question period. 
Thank you so much. And now I pass the floor to our Zoom participants. Professor Sadat, the floor is yours for five minutes. Ah, so it's muted. Uh, let me start again. Good morning, good afternoon, uh, buenos dias, buenas tardes, and thank you so much, uh, Mr. Ambassador and dear colleagues and friends for the opportunity to be here, even if not in person. Uh, this lawsuit is really quite fascinating, as Dr. Castellanos has argued uh, in a, a recent paper being used to close gaps between aspirational international legal rules and their actual enforceability. And I know many of the speakers, including uh, Carlos Vasquez, who just spoke, will focus on some of the technical details of the Smith and Wesson lawsuit. Um, but I think it's also important to look at some of the background and the fundamentals that are surrounding this place. And here I revert a little bit to um, Dr. Maran's uh, initial remarks. The extraordinary catalog of harms evinced by Mexico's original complaint in the lawsuit, which detail a death toll and injury wrought by the illegal trafficking of US manufactured and or distributed weapons, and particularly assault weapons into Mexico includes killings of judges, soldiers, ordinary men, women, and children, financial harm, injury, uh, and all of this in occurred expans extensively after the US lifted its federal assault weapons ban in 2004. There's also a stark picture of thousands of gun dealerships that are located on the US-Mexico border, as opposed to only one dealership in Mexico itself. And it's certainly a testament to the manner in which the allegations of the complaint are surely correct, even if they don't win before the particular judge in question. It's undisputable that the US gun violence crisis, which kills 40,000 people every year in the United States, has spilled over the borders of our neighbor to the south and throughout the world. And although Mexico's complaint is careful not to call out the US government for wrongdoing in the case, because it's a very different kind of case, in fact, the US government's failure to take the necessary measures required um, to staunch the human rights uh, fallout from this case uh, is, uh, un, un, without a doubt, uh, placing the United States in violation of international treaty and customary international law. In my first article on this issue, um, Gun Violence and Human Rights, I catalog some of the human rights involved, the right to life, to security, to health, to be free from ill treatment, racial discrimination, gender equality, the right to freedom of religion, expression, and belief, the right to peaceful assembly and association, special protection for children, attacks on elections and elected officials also suggest that the unfettered gun violence undermines the right to participate in free and fair elections and democracy itself. The principal but not the only treaty involved is the ICCPR, which was ratified by the United States, but subject to significant reservations, including a proviso that cases under it are not directly justiciable in the United States. This is also true for the International Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination, and the United States has not ratified a whole host of other treaties, uh, nor has it ratified the optional protocol to the ICCPR, which would have granted individuals a right of standing or petition before the Human Rights Committee. Yet some of the rights in international human rights law have parallels either in the US constitution or state constitutions. And in fact, our research has shown that 32 states protect the right to life in their constitutions outside the context of abortion. And at least one of those states has determined that the right to bear arms under the second amendment or a state equivalent is not absolute and has to be weighed against other rights. In my second article on the question, I argue that mass shootings in schools uh, actually qualify as ill treatment under the Torture Convention, a treaty that the United States has also ratified but subject to um, significant reservations. The Human Rights Council in its third periodic review of the United States honed in on the problem of gun violence, particularly as regards police use of excessive force and racial discrimination. And likewise, the Human Rights Committee, the High Commissioner for Human Rights, UN Special Rapporteurs, and the Inter-American Commission have focused on the issue of gun violence in the United States and cross-border, particularly the Inter-American Commission. 
The inaction of federal authorities has pretty much been the same under both Republican and Democratic administrations, which is not true of some states. And we fear even further rollbacks in terms of protection in the United States because the United States Supreme Court is now considering a case that could uh, extensively expand Second Amendment rights. So I suppose it's not surprising that if in the United States we care so little about our own human rights that the spillover to Mexico would not have come to a real um, uh, the US attention in a significant way. At the same time, I think international law can provide certain remedies here, uh, not just uh, in terms of um, the Smith and Wesson lawsuit, obviously, which is on which is on tort law. The UN Arms Trade Treaty, I think, also has a um, a significant role to play, and the Biden administration is uh, unrevoking the revocation of the United States signature that was done by the Trump administration. And I think the United States has an obligation not to frustrate the object and purpose of that treaty, which failure to act arguably violates. And finally, in addition to the potential tort and public nuisance case that Mexico has made out against the gun manufacturers, I think there's a fair case of state responsibility with respect to the United States in refusing to address a particularly pernicious form of transboundary tort. Um, the question is which international legal obligations might be at issue and the forum for their redress, whether judicial or diplomatic. Mexico's lawsuit studiously avoids and disclaims this issue for obvious strategically uh, important um, uh, issues, but it appears studying the larger picture that there is a lot more that can be done in addition to this particular suit. Mm -hmm. The United States wouldn't owe necessarily specific human rights obligations to Mexican nationals under the human rights treaties the US has ratified, but other treaties ratified by both states, as well as customary international law, could together impose a duty on the United States to rein in its own citizens to prevent cross-border harm, including free trade agreements, bilateral treaties governing the US-Mexico border. And given that firearm violence is a global public health issue, it may also be used to bring in the public health dimension of the problem and even consider whether action before the WHO is possible given the harm to human health that gun violence has uh, presented. Finding specific venues to pursue claims directly against the United States might be challenging, hence the brilliance really of Mexico's efforts to go after the source of the problem, the US gun manufacturers. As they've said, the gun is to gun violence as the mosquito is to malaria, it's the vector. Um, in US courts, tort law was used to go after the tobacco companies, and I think it's useful to see it as a remedy to go after gun manufacturers. And even if this lawsuit doesn't survive, I think it should, but it may not, uh, although I'm glad it'll be appealed if it doesn't uh, result uh, in success on this motion, the manufacturers, I think, should be nervous about lawsuits elsewhere, including Europe, where the OECD guidelines for multinational enterprises have human rights provisions. And as Dr. Castellano said in his introductory remarks, we've already seen some lawsuits in The Hague and in Paris and other places uh, under civil law. Why do we raise these issues if their justiciability is so doubtful or so challenging? And I'll just close with this. Um, I started my gun violence and human rights project because in the United States, the narrative was only focusing on the rights of the shooters. It wasn't focusing on the rights of the victims, the human rights of the victims, the public health crisis, the transboundary harm uh, in the Mexican case. What we've been doing with our work, what civil society organizations are doing with theirs, what the Mexican government is really doing with its lawsuit is trying to change the conversation. It's pushing norms, it's pushing a conversation away from a fixation on the ability to sell weapons unfettered by international or national law, moving away from the rights of the shooters to the rights of the victims and to society, and demonstrating that the gun violence crisis is not sort of some natural phenomenon, but a deliberate consequence of bad decision making at private and governmental levels, and not just a set of poor policy choices, but a question of violation of national and international law. So I'll stop there. Thank you so much for the opportunity to be part of this important conversation. Thank you so much for your contribution. And now I pass the floor to Christian. The floor is yours. Yeah, first of all, I will join my fellow panelists and thank you for inviting me to this event. Very interesting discussion on an unprecedented case. 
Um, yeah, I only have five minutes, so I have to be quick. I can probably only scratch the surface of some of the issues I wanted to talk about. Um, and to flag from the outset, I'm bringing a little bit the civil society perspective since I'm working for an NGO, as has been mentioned before in Berlin, that is actually using the law or strategic litigation in order to further human rights, the implementation of human rights. And I'm working in the business human rights department where we'll also work on the issue of arms manufacturing and arms exports. So with that background in mind, I decided to more or less structure my input by way of putting out six propositions. Um, and then we can see yeah, which of those will warrant further questions later on in the discussion. And I've been asked to contextualize a little bit the case in the field of international criminal law, which I'm a bit intimidated about given the um, yeah, professionalism of my prior speaker and also the moderator who have kind of published on this issue, but they will help out, I'll be sure. Um, so what's the, common, what's the common aspect when we look at this um, case that's currently pending in the US in international criminal law? I do think that we see both kind of seek to responsabilize or kind of to put as a topic the question of the accountability of arms manufacturers and exporters for the subsequent use of the weapons when this use is either intended or foreseeable. I think in, in this particular aspect, they're very close and they're obviously cross-cutting issues that can be discussed. Um, if we talk about international criminal law, though, we have to qualify and say, well, it only applies in times of armed conflict, be it international law of a non-international character. So to what extent we can use the things that I'm now going to explain for the particular scenario of Mexico is another debated topic. I know that I'm not going to go into this. Um, what I want to start with is, in our view in particular, from a civil society perspective, international criminal law already covers the activities of arms suppliers in terms of um, establishing secondary liability for aiding and abetting for certain activities if they fulfill certain conditions. Um, as a factual element is always required, for example, for aiding and abetting war crimes, it is clear by past jurisprudence of tribunals that the supply of weapons definitely can be qualified as fulfilling the objective element of aiding and abetting. We have had cases uh, concerning Charles Taylor or in the Kamuhanda case that have established these things. So that's not so much of a question. The bigger problem starts potentially with the mental element when you come to aiding and abetting these crimes, in particular when we talk about the ICC statute, um, less so when we talk about the international customary law. I think from a civil society perspective, what we would say um, is it's clear that an aider better and that in our case, the supplier of weapons obviously needs to want to engage in the conduct of supplying the weapons. And then at the minimum needs to be aware that with those weapons, a crime is going to be committed. There are people um, who might require kind of a more strict standard and that's still open to debate and we can potentially go back into that discussion at a later point. But just to flag a recent decision in 2021 in, uh, in France in relation to the Lafarge case, where exactly this idea of the knowledge is sufficient was reiterated in relation to the conduct of Lafarge and in the statement of the Advocate General accompanying the, the procedure, also the comparison was clearly and explicitly made to arms manufacturers and arms supplies on a comparative level. Um, so what I also wanted to highlight in this particular scenario that we're in is that in my view, the whole issue of criminal liability for aiding and abetting doesn't only cover those cases where we deal with illegal exports. So I mentioned those cases, Taylor and Kamuanda. We have had other cases in the Netherlands uh, with Kovenhoven and Van Anra. These were all cases concerned with illegal exports. But um, what we're trying to argue, and I think what's also relevant for the case in the US, um, is that the same standard applies for those experts that are in that sense legal or the sales that are legal. Um, and in that regard, I want to mention a currently pending communication under Article 15 uh, to the Office of the Prosecutor in which several European NGOs argue exactly that, namely that high ranking officials of European arms manufacturers and exporters might be criminally liable for aiding and abetting war crimes committed in the war in Yemen due to their supply that was authorized and licensed by their governments to Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates. The case is still lying there, the communication, we are still waiting for a decision from the OTP. So um, yeah, we'll be curious to see how this develops, but the argument definitely does make a difference between legal and illegal exports. So 
in essence, in my view, what international criminal law already confirms is that we have to operate on the basis that arms manufacturers and sellers um, uh, have to meet, let's say, a standalone separate responsibility to implement the risk assessment, what might happen with their weapons. And if it's foreseeable that they might be used in the Commission of Human Rights or International Humanitarian Law violations, then they might run the risk of criminal responsibility for this. Um, and one further aspect that comes a little bit from this civil society and using the law for the public interest perspective is both, let's say this case we see in the US, but also um, the communications to the International Criminal, law, uh, Criminal Court and other domestic cases are accompanied by really a wave is potentially too big of a word, but the administrative cases also challenging the granting of licenses um, to those armed companies exactly because of the risk that they might be used for, let's say, unintended but foreseeable consequences. And I think these kind of complement the picture that we're seeing. And I think with this, I want to close. In my view, the case that we see in the US perfectly fits into the current normative developments and the attempts we see currently to use the law in order to tackle this particular issue of arms manufacturers, sales, and export, and the subsequent use for violations of human rights law and international humanitarian law. I think I'll leave it at that for the time being. Christian, and now we turn to our last speaker on the panel. Dalia, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much uh, for inviting me uh, here. It's really an honor to, to be here and have the opportunity to speak about this very interesting case. And thank you also to the other panelists for their comments. They gave me a lot of food for thought. It's hard to speak at last uh, so with, with such interesting comments before. So let me say from my area of expertise in business and human rights that I find this a very fascinating case, although I do find this case to be in the realm of business and human rights and uh, in line with other business and human rights cases. And this is because the case is filed against a company for transnational human rights abuses and the fact that it's filed using tort law is not exceptional. Leon has already reminded us how many cases there have been in the UK, in the Netherlands, um, certainly in Europe using tort law to actually um, file complaints against companies for transnational business and human rights litigation. But even in the United States with the ATS litigation, of course, uh, there is an element of international law, but also a tort law combined um, in these kind of cases. Um, however, although this case can be classified as a business and human rights case, I think it has a number of peculiarities that are particularly interesting. And I, I have a very long list, but I'll focus only on one uh, that I think it's, um, it's relevant and we can talk about others maybe during the Q&A. And the thing that struck me is that this case is brought by a state. Right, we mentioned this already. And to me, this is interesting from two different angles. The first one is that I have dedicated uh, part of my research about transnational human rights litigation and whether or not this can be considered as legitimate. There have been a number of claims that mm, transnational human rights litigation is illegitimate because it requires one state, usually a developed country, to apply its law its, and to assert jurisdiction over damages occurred in developing countries. Uh, this has been deemed to be illegitimate by some scholars and even imperialist by others. And we have cases in which you, in which court in the Western world decided to dismiss on jurisdictional basis cases because they were, they were afraid to, to be considered imperialist. Uh, an example that I think it's, it's, uh, it's telling is the Bofal litigation in the 1980s in the United States where US courts decided that they didn't, they couldn't assert jurisdiction over damages committed in India. Uh, and, but also in more recent cases, as been mentioned before, Kyobel were concerned over um, Nigerian um, authority over the case was, was central. So in this sense, and, 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 and let's say that my argument has always been that this is not the case, that actually um, host states often support the litigation filed by victims against 
parent companies or corporation in Western jurisdiction. Well, here we have the case of where host state not only supporting the victim, but filing the complaint itself. So to me, it's very fascinating because it's really revealing a shift somehow in what we can call the legitimate use of transnational litigation. And then there is another element that I find fascinating on the fact that we have a state filing a complaint. When I first read this, uh, this case, I thought this is like investment arbitration reverse. Because, well, when we think about investment arbitration, we usually typically have a foreign investor filing a complaint against a state, right? Seeking its right. Here we have a state filing a complaint against a foreign investor, uh, a foreign company. Uh, say, and when you talk about investment arbitration, foreign investor is usually a company, right? Uh, but obviously here is not arbitration, here is in front of a domestic court. And this parallel made me reflect on the fact that when we talk about investment arbitration, sure, the case is always the tip of the iceberg. We do have um, a company filing a complaint against the state, but really the underlying relation that we're discussing is the relation between the two states. The relation that brought a whole state and a home state to file an investment arbitration treaty. And there are a number of scholars that have already analyzed the historical and geopolitical circumstances that brought states from the global north and the global south to sign those kind of treaties. So here I fear that this case is also the tip of the iceberg. And the tip of the iceberg about the relation that we are uh, uncovering here with this discussion between states that sell weapons and states that import weapons. And this includes, as it is the case in bilateral investment treaties, not only the relation directly between the two states, but also the relation between companies, private actors affected by this affected by this trade, companies and private actors in the home states and victims in the host states that are the receiver of this trade. So I'll stop here and uh, I look forward to your question. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dalia. Thank you, the whole panel, for this uh, wonderful beginning of the discussion and that everyone stuck to time. So I have actually very brief questions for everyone and then I open the floor for discussion and for questions from the audience. So my question for Carlos is since you have been, um, yes, since you have been uh, participating in drafting of the Amicus Curia brief recently in this case and you worked specifically on the choice of law questions, are there any particular points related to the choice of law as, um, as it is relevant for the case now that you would like to mention in addition to what you have already uh, talked about? In particular, um, I would be interested, as you know, in the principle of international comity, if it's important. So this would be my question and I will share all the questions right now and then we'll answer them in turn. So my question for Professor Sadat would be about the relevance of customary international law in U.S. courts. This is a very broad question, I understand, but we rely a lot in international legal discourse on customary international law. What would be the chances also of customary international law being invoked uh, by the U.S. court in this particular case? What would be your prediction? I understand it's a bit of speculation, but would be interesting to hear your opinion. Then for Christian, I cannot help but ask you to elaborate a little bit on the Yemen case. And in particular, uh, since we talk about international criminal law standard here, uh, on the question of mens rea and actus res for complicity. And um, advisor Alcantara mentioned pattern, certain pattern of activity that can be used in the tort litigation here. I remember that also in the Yemen case, there is certain discussion about the pattern of corporate activity that can be used to prove uh, mens rea, or in criminal law language, that <coughs> basically means intention or knowledge. So perhaps with a special focus on pattern, if you can talk about this case. 
And then finally for Dahlia, if you could please talk a little bit uh, about specific cases that you know that may resemble this case that have uh, extraterritorial element and where we saw tort litigation since you have an expertise, perhaps there's a particular case. I know that Leon mentioned several cases. Perhaps you would like to speak in particular about some examples of similar litigations happening and what we can learn from them for this case. And I have an extra question for advisor Alcantara, which came online, and I will add it to this round of questions. So it came from Anna from Geneva, who is wondering whether the Mexican government may consider also suing Canadian mining companies in Mexico and other uh, companies that are misusing water. And she's referring to the do no harm principle in general. So she's, I guess, referring to the broader uh, strategic aims of the Mexican government. So with this, uh, I conclude the first round of questions, which was primarily my questions. And um, perhaps it would be best to allow the panelists to respond and also perhaps to respond to each other. And then I promise that we'll have a second round uh, where I will ask uh, the audience to contribute questions. Thank you. So we'll start in the same order. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so the question for me was about, uh, to elaborate on the, the argument uh, why the PLCA statute does not apply extraterritorially, uh, and in conjunction with that, the, the more general choice of law issue. Um, the, the argument is actually extremely technical, and so I, I'm, I think I'm not going to go <laughs> into the, uh, the details of that argument. It's based on a rather um, on a reading of the text of the statute, which is what the Supreme Court uh, decisions on extraterritoriality call for and require. So, but it, it does, um, because it does require a, a fairly close reading of a fairly technical statute, I, I think it, uh, I'm not going to get into it in this forum, but um, I will make a, a broader point that about the, the role of uh, principles of extraterritoriality, and in particular, the US Supreme Court's uh, new recent cases that uh, strengthen the presumption against extraterritoriality. And in this respect, I'll link it to something that uh, Dahlia was saying. Um, so the recent decisions, and I mentioned them in my earlier remarks, that uh, in, um, strengthen the presumption against extraterritoriality are based on notions of comedy. So uh, uh, um, uh, um, I know that's something that uh, uh, was raised in the question as well. Uh, the idea, and, and it, the cases, as, as Dahlia mentioned, do uh, suggest that the reason we're not extending our law extraterritorially is because we don't want to be imperialists. In the Kiobel case, the, the court said uh, the United States doesn't rule the world. And that's why in these cases, the court has generally decided that affirmative causes of action created by US law do not apply to conduct or persons uh, abroad. Uh, so it's, it's ba it's, it purports to be a very anti-imperialist concept. Um, but m um, it noticed that this uh, would be turned on its head if it were applied. Uh, um, uh, if the court decided that the immunity conferred by PLCA does apply extraterritorially. In other words, if the, I think the, the concept of not applying laws extraterritorially for reasons of comedy and for reasons of not uh, being imperialist apply all the more strongly to a, uh, a statute like PLCA because if you apply PLCA extraterritorially, we would be saying that a statute passed by the United States um, cuts off a cause of action that is created by foreign law, in this case, Mexican law. And so I think that's the, the, con the, um, the opposite of comedy. And so I think comedy, which is the ultimate basis of the Supreme Court's anti-extraterritoriality decisions, uh, um, apply all the more strongly in a case like this, where federal law creates an immunity from US for US corporations. To apply an immunity broadly extraterritorially would be against comedy and would be the United States, an example of the United States trying to rule the world. So I think I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much. Uh, now I pass the floor to Leila. Professor Sadat, please. Thank you so much. And um, I agree entirely with uh, Carlos's point about um, the extraterritoriality 
And with respect to customary international law, you know, this is a highly contested area of US law right now. We have jurisprudence of our Supreme Court going back basically to the founding that says international law is part of United States law. And of course, the position of the Supreme Court was that customary international law was just to be applied by the courts as any other kind of law. And there's case after case after case involving a whole variety of areas um, in which the court did exactly that, whether it was questions of piracy or um, the law of the sea or uh, the laws of neutrality, customary international law was regularly applied by the United States federal courts. Mm -hmm. And starting in, I would say, the 1990s, there was a pushback against that um, from conservative scholars who argued that customary international law really should not be part of US law. I won't go into all the details. I just want to answer the question, really. Um, what I would say is the rule remains and significant to the cha challenges to the rule uh, have appeared. And they've particularly appeared in the context of the alien tort statute cases, where we've seen a, a, a whole group of, of US Supreme Court decisions that have cut back on the possibility for the ATS to be used. I, I think that the holding uh, of Sosa versus Alvarez Machine is still a good holding, that so long as you can find a norm of custom sufficiently definite, to be used as a cause of action, you could still use it in a US court under customary international law. The difficulty is when you combine now the uh, presumption against extraterritoriality and the, the conversations among the justices attempting to limit the ATS is how successful would that be? That said, I've recently been doing work in a lot of other areas of international law in US courts. And because there's such a, an enormous body of case law out there where customary international law has been used, I think it's going to be difficult to um, sort of change it and get rid of it entirely. And so I think there is a possibility in this situation for an ATS claim to survive. Um, in the context of gun violence in Mexico that's being uh, brought about by US manufacturers, assuming one can find the right strategic um, way to craft that litigation in the right forum. So I think I'll stop there. Thank you. And uh, Christian? Christian is offline for the moment, so perhaps we'll turn to Dale and then we go back to Christian. Okay. Yeah, while he's logging back in, we yeah. just Perfect. go to Dalia. Um, yeah, so thank you very much for your question. So I think that uh, absolutely this case is to a certain extent similar to other uh, business and human rights cases using tort law, as I said, to attempt to hold to account a company for transnational human rights abuses. And I was uh, particularly interested um, in this uh, obligation that Mexico uh, argues for, that uh, the corporation would have an obligation to monitor the downstream distribution of the arms sales. So this uh, rings a bell uh, because uh, in Europe uh, there have been the French and then the German and the Dutch and now there is a EU proposal for a mandatory human rights and environmental due diligence law which requires holding companies to oversee the activities of their subsidiaries and supply chains. And so this is, to me, a parallel, a monitoring obligation, right, that uh, companies would have. And then, of course, we can look at the jurisprudence in the UK on the duty of care, which is also based on the duty of care that a parent company has to oversee the activities committed by its subsidiary and on the triangular relation in tort between parent company, victim and subsidiary. However, uh, what is different here is that we're not talking about parent and subsidiary company and it's not clear, entirely clear, clear to me from the case if we're talking about a possible definition of a supply chain because you were talking about companies selling their weapons to other companies uh, or, or to other traders and then, then, then get these weapons muggled into Mexico. So I think an interesting question for me would be if this is a step forward in establishing these duties of companies, these potentially mandatory human rights duties uh, to monitor what 
uh, are the effects of their sales, or if we can somehow reconduct this to the same idea of mandatory human rights and environmental due diligence, which is in the building, right? It's it's been established, uh, as I said, in a few countries, but uh, there is this proposal for a EU directive on the topic, and we will have to see how it develops further. Thank you. And then we go now to Christian, who is hopefully online again. Yeah, I am sorry. There was a short circuit with my computer. That was very interesting, but here I am uh, <laughs> back to the discussion. Um, yeah, so let me try to answer the question. Um, I think when it comes to this mens rea standard that we mentioned before and that your question was headed at, so what we need to do is establish the knowledge or the awareness or under a stricter standard, even the attention um, that the weapons are then going to be used for the commission of whatever type of war crime. Um, and I think the question is then, how do you do that? Um, and obviously you look at all the information that is out there um, and that was kind of available to the company and where you think the company has actually seen it. Um, and at that particular point, I think there's an interesting connection also to the ongoing debate about mandatory human rights due diligence for businesses, because what we already see under the standards of the OECD guidelines or the UNGP, um, you have to make a risk assessment of what might be done with your products when you sell them. It's a bit more clear cut when you have one particular end user um, yeah, and you're supplying to that end user or if you have a relatively long, let's say, distribution chain involving even smuggling and so on and so forth. But at the same time, it's clear that also arms companies by now have to inform themselves about what might happen with those weapons. And these things you can already include in the assessment and you might even use um, as an argument, so, so to speak, for a law-abiding company, it would mean that they are aware of certain pieces of information, and then you can use those informations to potentially deduce the awareness or knowledge. Um, and then I think at that point, the pattern argument that you were mentioning comes back in. It doesn't so much concern the behavior of the company, but the behavior of the end user. So, for example, in the case of Yemen that I mentioned before, the pattern argument goes that you can see a pattern of uh, repeated violations of international humanitarian law committed by the Saudi-led coalition forces in Yemen. Um, and that this pattern is obvious to everyone who deals kind of with the situation and someone who supplies weapons into this conflict is obviously someone who has to deal with these questions. So you can ask yourself after a certain point in time, so if there's a clearly established pattern, wouldn't it be even justified to assume that the simple awareness or knowledge might turn into intention if you look at this pattern and you see it's not changing, but you continuously decide to supply the weapons into that particular situation. So that's a little bit how the argument of the pattern goes, basically, to answer your question. And then if I may, because I wanted to jump into um, this question more on other cases in the field of business and human rights, because I find it's a very interesting discussion, in particular for the downstream activities. That's a heavily debated field. Um, yeah, as was rightly said already, in relation to the, let's say, newly adopted laws and the initiatives that are currently uh, out there in Europe. What I would like to emphasize is a little bit that there might be other fields of hazardous products where we have seen similar cases that might be useful for the consideration of this particular case on weapons. And what I'm thinking about is in particular highly hazardous pesticides because you have a relatively similar context. You have also at times export activities, you have dealers and distributors involved in several, let's say, steps in the supply chain. These dealers might even be involved in selling the products uh, differently from what formerly was the intention of the initial manufacturer by not supplying sufficient information on the risk on how they might be used and so on and so forth. So I think we might have a bit of a similar constellation and we have a lot of cases going on in the US. And we have also cases um, in Europe, currently there's one that my organization is involved in, which concerns the export of one particular pesticides and subsequent health damages suffered by people who used it. And we initially thought about the product liability claim, which is still kind of one element in the argument, but we also thought about of simply applying tort law, the tort of negligence, because of the fact that a manufacturer of a hazardous good um, has to meet a certain duty of care towards its customers, basically, and also potentially people that foreseeably are being affected negatively when the products are being used. So I think there's a lot in 
having a comparative look on other cases related to hazardous goods. Thank you, Christian. Thank you very much. And then, advisor. Yeah. Thank you very much for the question on um, if the government of Mexico would consider suing uh, mine companies or those that uh, profit from uh, natural water. Um, it's not now over my desk. Um, it's that we're aware of the issue, but it's a matter of, uh, I believe, standing. goes back to the, to the gone litigation. Uh, we will have to prove uh, the harm that the government of Mexico would suffer as a victim. Um, it takes me to the opportunity. Uh, we reserve in our complaint um, on terms of a standing, resorting on the doctrine of parent patria to represent um, the government of Mexico could represent the interest of its citizens um, because of the challenging of proving that and some judicial precedents, we didn't use it as the first argument. I believe to sue um, mining companies or those that uh, profit from natural um, water, uh, we will have to use power and patria rather than direct harm. But let me just uh, mention and use this opportunity to say this. Um, I, I'm struck by the, everybody's comments and, and I think this is the future for individuals to claim um, remedies from harm suffered in instances whether the law allows the companies to abuse rights or there's laws that offer immunities or there's a lack of enforcement. I think this is the reality and we, we need to be ready to complain and file civil suits whether it's for um, harm caused for uh, seabed mining or the exploitation of um, resources in space. I think the future is here. And as we say when we talk about the, the gun litigation, the government of Mexico is not again the gun trade. If there's going to be a trade, it has to be transparent, accountable, and responsible. And I think that is similar and we should use it for seabed mining, the exploitation of um, the space, the Antarctic, there's a lot that we could use in civil tort litigation to put um, businesses in line with uh, human rights. Wonderful, thank you. So now we have a few minutes left and I open the floor for questions in the audience. So if anyone wants to ask one of the panelists or all of the panelists a question, it would be very welcome in this moment and it's also your last chance. Just a bit of <laughs> scarcity <laughs> mindset, yes. Thank you very much. Um, I would like uh, to give a small example of bringing it one step further. Last week, um, those who started the Urgenda case against uh, Shell have uh, written a letter to the CEOs of Shell personally and said, if you don't, as a policymaker, make sure that you uh, 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 that you put into work what the court has decided, we will uh, litigate personally. And I would like the colleague from uh, Germany, um, I forgot your name, um, excuse me, Christian, to maybe uh, reflect on that uh, movement from the Urgenda case. Uh, my name is Jose Miguel Bravo. I'm from the Ministry of Justice in the Netherlands. Questions? Hi, um, I'm Bertie Warren from the Hague Conference on Private International Law. Uh, so my uh, my questions kind of aimed at Professor Vasquez, but perhaps also for for um, the Mr. Advisor. I I'm interested to know to what extent. Forum non-convenience might be a dangerous aspect of the case. If you think, I, I don't know what the Massachusetts court, how they deal with that, or whether that might be uh, on the basis of the harm suffered in Mexico, whether you think that might be a concern if it's already been raised or not. And if so, I guess, how you're planning on countering that. So yeah, in particular, considering the choice of law aspects as well. Wonderful. Uh, one more question from online audience, which is anonymous. It's about the political doctrine question and whether um, one of the panelists, perhaps the advisor, thinks it is more of a political question and is to be dealt with by the executive branch. I know we covered some of this, but perhaps you have some concluding thoughts on that. 
So if we don't have any more questions from the audience, then I turn to the speakers, Professor Vasquez. Yes, um, thank you for the question. The question was about uh, for the doctrine of forum nonconvenience, which is a, a doctrine that uh, common law courts apply, uh, although uh, civil law countries generally don't. Um, the doctrine has not been invoked in this case. Uh, the, the, um, the defendants have not asked for the case to be dismissed on forum nonconvenience grounds. Um, so uh, as to why, I, um, I suppose it's a strategic matter and maybe the uh, uh, Alejandro would want to uh, address that, um, but it just hasn't been invoked. If it were invoked, you know, there are public interest factors, private interest factors. There are uh, a number of cases, um, the Lago Agrio litigation uh, uh, um, from uh, Ecuador that were dismissed on forum nonconvenience grounds. And um, I would think that the experience with that <laughs> might be a, uh, a reason that the U.S. courts won't be uh, won't as easily dismiss cases on forum not convenience grounds going forward. Um, but uh, that's just speculation. And are we going to have a chance to to ref um, uh, re respond no. to each other? No, uh, would be a good moment. Okay. To, to I just respond. wanted to say. Uh, <laughs> Uh, just to add a little bit on uh, the question that was addressed to Leila on the status of international law as U.S. law. Um, I think um, I agree with Leila that the Supreme Court has not yet overruled the Paquete Habana, which is the case uh, from the early 1900s that says customary international law is part of U.S. law and to be applied by U.S. courts. Um, but, I, um, you know, indications that are that the current court is not as strongly committed to that principle as, as prior U.S. courts were. Um, but I, I want to suggest that there's another way that in customer international law and international human rights can come into the case. And that is, well, um, Mexico argues in this case that Mexican law applies. So the fact that, you know, even if this, the Supreme Court were of the view that customer international law is not part of U.S. law, that's irrelevant if you apply Mexican law. And so that leads me to the question, what is the status of international law under Mexican law, and is that a, a viable um, uh, strategy to pursue to bring uh, international law into this case? Thank you very much. I believe we have Christian next in line. Yeah, thank you very much. That's, uh, that's a very interesting question. Um, I think I'm going to try to answer it still within the framework of criminal law and not venture now into other fields of law. And the question if you could go yeah, with civil lawsuits after uh, individually identified people within the company, um, because that opens up a completely different and new field. But in terms of the criminal law and international criminal law, as I was talking about it before, I mean, it's obvious, for example, in the case that we um, submitted in relation to the arms exports to Yemen, th this all concerns individuals. There is no, I mean, there is no criminal liability for the corporations as such under the ICC statute. So you go after the individuals. Um, and for me, I mean, one consideration in there is always that you really kind of pay attention to who you identify as the individual, because we don't want to, I don't really know how this is called in English, but you really want the people relatively high up who are actually responsible to take those decisions and not identify people who have play a minor role in that. So that's very difficult at times to identify the relevant people in particular when you don't have enough access to kind of who decides what house the structure within the company. So this just to flag as a consideration because at least from my experience as a European based lawyer without discovery, it's sometimes difficult to get to these pieces of information. Um, and at the same time, there are some developments, at least in the domestic sphere, where you have the possibility to go after the company as such. The aforementioned Lafarge case is a case in point, and it might offer different, I mean, different options basically for the accountability work that you're striving to do with this. So, and that again relates back then to, let's say, a more political strategic consideration. So, if you go after the company as such, it offers you somewhat more institutionalized impact basically on the organization and that might have, might have might have advantages but it might have disadvantages if you can't 
convince the relevant people to change their behavior by just focusing on the company, but vice versa, only focusing on the individual might also have some problems. So in my view, these two go somehow hand in hand, and we do also kind of in the more general field of development, we do at least in Europe see also a more strongly led debate about uh, criminal liability for corporations as such, even in countries where this was kind of, yeah, like 10 years ago, not really thinkable as a concept. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Christian. Now I turn to advisor Alcantara. Um, thank you very much. Um, just on, on the forum non-convenience, there, there's an element that they, the defendants haven't uh, bring this, uh, haven't brought this, this argument. But when I were complaining, not only we, we asked for um, monetary compensation, but also uh, changes in the way they trade their product. And the enforcement of that judgment, it would be a lot easier to perform, to enforce, by a US federal judge than a Mexican judge, because the companies are in the United States and they trade, they perform their activity in the United States. So if the defendants wanted to bring this up, I think we would be ready to sue them in Mexico, but it's just a matter of, of enforcement in terms of actually the applicability of the, the judgment. Um, on international law, uh, it applies similarly than in the United States. In this case, we claim that the substantive uh, tort law, Mexican tort law applies. The rest, the judge will be able to use uh, notions of international law. And in the political doctrine, um, this is something that exists in the United States for those that are not familiar. The um, uh, courts can uh, uh, refuse to hear or decide on a case if it's, they believe is heavily politicized or political or is something that the executive branch could solve. Now, this case is very polarized, I would say it. But at the end, it's a tort law case where Eight defendants have caused harm to one plaintiff, the government of Mexico, and that's, that has nothing political around it. It's a tort, transparent tort law, and we expect the judge to allow us to pursue and have our day in court and present our evidence and prove that we have suffered harm by these eight companies. Thank you. And I would like to give an opportunity to Dahlia or Leila for the last concluding comment because we are having our last uh, round of questions. So if you want to comment on anything that has been said, now it's a good time. So we'll start with Professor Sadat, if you have any last comment to make. And we cannot hear you, I think. There, yeah, there. I was having trouble unmuting. Um, I would agree with the um, the question on the political question doctrine is a really interesting one, and it is true that there are political um, elements to the arms trade that um, could be resolved through diplomatic channels or through other negotiations um, between Mexico and the United States. But I agree entirely that this particular case is a legal case, and it is trying to apply very standard principles of law to a very interesting um, legal dispute. So I would um, suggest that the, the case not be dismissed. I, I, I'm, I don't have a crystal ball. I don't know what Judge Saylor will do with the case. Um, but uh, I think the, there's some good odds that it could survive a motion for summary judgment, at least, uh, excuse me, motion to dismiss in part. Um, and if not, I hope that Mexico will appeal. Mm. Thank you. Dahlia? Thank you very much. Uh, yeah. Uh, the other's comment on positive obligations, and uh, I think that uh, one could reflect on the case law of human rights courts uh, that, that bring to positive obligation. I'm thinking about one case in particular that may be interesting, um, uh, which is called Rancev uh, versus Cyprus and Russia. And what's interesting about this case, the human trafficking case, is that the European Court of Human Rights found that um, there is an obligation not only 
of the, let's call it whole state where a crime happens. So in this case, it was a woman that was murdered, but it was a victim of traffic. And so the question was whether or not Cyprus is, has a positive obligation. Of course it does, because the victim died in Cyprus, but also whether Russia has. And the, the court said, yes, it does, because it, it is the state where the traffic starts. So this is some kind of positive obligation which has, you know, transnational effect. Um, and and it's and it's interesting because this is not only positive obligations that are developed by the European Court of Human Rights, but also in the inter-American system and also by the American Commission on Human Rights. So you could see a parallel if human trafficking or gun trades of something that starts in one country but then has detrimental effect in another one. And so I think um, the other panelists for bringing up this idea of positive obligation because I think uh, there is still a big connection to human rights even if this case is very much structured on tort law. Thank you. Thank you for this brilliant discussion and I would like to conclude with a short poem with the permission of the organizers. Um, and I know we are all a bit tired, but I would love to read this poem by Jen Richardson. She's an American writer and poet. I cannot tell you how the light comes. What I know is that it is more ancient than imagining, that it travels across an ast astounding expanse to reach us. What it loves, searching out what is hidden, what is lost, what is forgotten, or in peril, or in pain that it has a fondness for the body, for finding its way towards flesh, for tracing the edges of form, for shining forth through the eye, the hand, the heart. I cannot tell you how the light comes, but it does, that it will, that it works its way into the deepest dark that enfolds you, that though it may seem long ages in coming or arrive in a shape you did not foresee, and so, May we this day turn ourselves toward it. May we lift our faces to let it find us. May we bend our bodies to follow the arc it makes. May we open and open more and open still to the blessed light that comes. Thank you and thank you very much for this wonderful event. With this we conclude.